Welcome to the 2016 Second Quarter Investment Call with the San Diego Foundation. I'm Teresa Nakata, Vice President of Communication. Thank you for joining us today. This year, the Foundation implemented quarterly investment calls as an enhanced service to donors. The calls provide direct access to our investment leaders in a consistent, convenient, concise format so donors can remain informed about the performance of their charitable assets. Leading today's discussion will be Horacio Valeris and Matt Spedig. Horacio Valeris is the president and a principal of HAV Capital, LLC, and serves as investment chair for the San Diego Foundation Board of Governors. Horacio has more than 24 years of investment management experience, is the portfolio manager for the HAV International Growth Strategy, and oversees all investment and trading functions. As Chief Investment Officer for the San Diego Foundation, Matt Fedig oversees and manages our investment strategies and activities. This includes working with the Board Investment Committee, senior staff, auditors, professional volunteers, fund managers, and outside consultants to establish, maintain, administer, and monitor policies related to Foundation investments. Today, Horacio and Matt We'll start the call with a brief macroeconomic update, followed by performance and attribution reports for our endowment portfolio, long-term portfolio, medium-term portfolio, and short-term portfolio. We will conclude with a 10-minute question and answer session. To submit questions for the Q&A session, please use the questions chat fun function on your screen anytime throughout the call. Any questions unanswered during the call today will be answered via email. You can access slides and a recording of today's call by end of day tomorrow on our website at sdfoundation.org backslash investments. Now, Horacio will get us started. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for, uh, for joining us. Um, we last time or last quarter we talked about uh, briefly about the economic outlook, uh, which was one of slow growth, low interest rates around the world, and continued uh, economic and monetary stimulus. Since then, probably the biggest event to happen was the vote on June 23rd uh, by British uh, by the British to on whether to leave or stay uh, as part of the EU. As all of you know by now, um, the, Brit the Brits decided to vote to leave the EU, and while it was a very split vote by age and by location, um, the winning margin for uh, leaving was, uh, was actually quite significant, uh, particularly for these types of votes. The reasons why the vote came out the way, it, um, the way it did, we believe, number one is immigration and all the issues with uh, refugees uh, pouring into Europe. Secondly, relief uh, or desired relief from uh, many EU mandates, which uh, some uh, services have estimated cost the UK somewhere around 30 billion pounds a year. And then finally, which we're seeing around the world, anger at establishment politicians. Uh, that's not only happening in the UK, but also happening, as, as all of you know here. Um, the market reaction, as shown in this chart, uh, was uh, initially swift and it was very negative. The way that you would read this chart is basically a cumulative change in, in prices for the um, nine assets that are listed at the bottom of the chart starting after the June 23rd vote. So as you can see, the S&P 500 index, which is a blue line kind of in the middle of the chart, initially dropped about 5%, but has since recovered all its losses. The uh, UK market, which is uh, shown by the, by the dash, by the, not the dash, the solid uh, magenta line, was about the same, while the European stock markets dropped about 10%, that's shown by the Euro stock index, stocks index. Now, the drops happened over the first few days of the vote, and since then we have actually had quite a reversal where the U.S. market has actually uh, hit new highs. The key things to note here is that the bond markets, as shown uh, by the U.S. 10-year bond yield in the dashed blue line at the bottom of this chart, has uh, the, the yield on bonds fell. In other words, interest rates went lower, uh, bond prices rose, and have remained 
pretty much at the levels seen in the in the first few days um, of the uh, of the Brexit vote. The other thing to note in this chart is that is the blue line at the top. That's the price of gold. Gold initially spiked up five percent and then continued to rise until it uh, plateaued at a, at a gain of about nine percent. So, what the interest rate and what gold's telling you is that there's still a lot of uh, uncertainty about what the future holds. Um, it will take a very long time, uh, we believe, two to three years, to figure out the impact of, uh, of Britain's decision to exit the, the EU. And that impact uh, could be positive or it could be negative, but it depends on a lot of things. It depends on the conditions for exit. It depends on whether uh, they strike deals with other countries, trade deals and uh, immigration deals with the EU and so on, and it will more than anything depend on whether they ever trigger the exit, um, because now the betting markets, if you look at them, they're saying that Article 50 of the EU treaty, which is the one they would have to trigger to exit the EU, there's more than a 60% chance that that will never happen. So um, our view on this event is, as you can see, markets react, they, they move back to more normal positions, um, you really have to take a long view, and uh, and we'll see how it plays out, but we're keeping an eye on it. Now, if we look at the next slide, uh, this goes back to my original comment about economic activity around the world. This slide has the difference between the actual gross domestic product reported in each country for each of the last six quarters. So the lines, the bars to the left are the furthest away quarter, the bars to the right in any one color, color or the nearest quarter. The difference between the actual and the expected gross domestic product. So the way you would read it, if you look at the biggest bar in the dark blue section of the chart for the US uh, gross domestic product surprise, you would see that in the first quarter of this year, the actual number came out about 80% less than what people were expecting. So if people were expecting 2%, it came out at 0.4%. And as you can see, for most of these countries, um, with the exception of China, which is uh, on the far right, the, what's actually happened in, econom in economies has been way below the expectations uh, of analysts and economists in the countries. What is, what is this telling you? Basically, it's telling you that we are under, the growth is undershooting even the already subdued expectations um, in uh, in all these places. Now, one of the best uh, performers is the UK, and obviously the best one on this chart is, is China. Um, China is a little bit of an outlier because I, I I believe, and a lot of people do too, that they they sort of they give a growth expectation and then they come up with that number. So I wouldn't put a lot of stock in that. But the UK um, has actually been one of the best performers uh, around the world. Growth has been slow but they've been doing better than, uh, than most other countries. And we believe that's because they've been running their own monetary policy. They restricted government spending early on after the financial crisis of uh, 2008. And hopefully now, if they do leave the EU, they'll even have more tools at their disposal to be able to, uh, to uh, surprise on the upside in their economy. That's one of the reasons that I said that Brexit could actually uh, be a positive um, going forward. Finally, if we turn to valuations of equity markets, and this is a question that comes up often, you know, we've had a, a now an eight-year bull market since the bottoms, in, a seven-year bull market since the bottoms in uh, early 2009. What's going on uh, for valuations, and is it still worth being in the stock market? Well, this chart shows uh, the price, the price to book value, price to earnings ratio, price to cash earnings and so on for uh, three regions. Um, EFA is Europe, um, Australasia, and, uh, and Far East. Um, so it's basically the developed market X of the US. Then we have the US in the dark blue uh, line. And then we have emerging markets, which are um, everything from Brazil and China to Russia to, um, to Hungary and Poland and so on. As you can see, valuations uh, in the U.S. and in Europe are, are, are higher than in the emerging markets. It doesn't matter really uh, which valuation you look at. Um, build would be the inverse of the price-to-earnings ratio, so, so 
a high number there implies a lower valuation. Um, and, and as you can see, um, if, you, if you compare these numbers to history, both the U.S. and Europe look like they're expensive relative to, uh, to, to their history, while emerging markets look like they're more fair valued relative to history. Um, we look at these to, to make some tilts in the portfolio, but, but our true belief is that you, just like with Brexit, you take a long-term view, you uh, stay the course, and, uh, and you continue to invest in a diversified uh, portfolio. And over time, that will de deliver the results that you need in order to fund, um, to fund your uh, philanthropy. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Matt, who's going to talk about the performance. Thanks, Horacio, and, and welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us again this quarter. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about performance and keep in mind that some of the key drivers of performance for the endowment were also the key drivers of performance for the other pools. Uh, so I may spend a little bit more time here on the endowment slide, uh, and then we'll quickly move through uh, the other slides. So for in quarter, the endowment was up 2.1%, and for the year-to-date period, calendar year, it was up 3.1%. And when we look at those results and compare them to other institutions, uh, nonprofits, foundations, and endowments of a similar size, uh, the quarter, second quarter result was in the fifth percentile. And the year-to-date number was in the 27th percentile, one being best and 100 being worst. So certainly it was a good quarter by all means uh, for our endowment portfolio. You see it was in line with our policy index for the quarter uh, and for the year-to-date period. Uh, but our asset allocation uh, performed particularly well uh, over this time period. Um, really in the second quarter, all of the asset classes that we invest in delivered positive results. Uh, U.S. equities were the strongest performer for the second quarter with small cap leading the way. Uh, but I think the probably the biggest point of distinction for performance for the endowment and for all of our other portfolios during the quarter uh, with our position in emerging markets equities. Uh, based on that, the valuation exhibit that Horacio just showed you, we do have an overweight to emerging markets equities relative to uh, the benchmark we use and to other institutions. And uh, it just so happened that uh, our overweight um, helped our non-U.S. assets perform uh, quite well for the quarter. And furthermore, the managers that we used in the emerging markets equity segment uh, performed quite well, uh, too. Uh, so I'd say emerging markets equity, certainly over the calendar year-to-date basis, has been uh, the, one of the strongest points uh, for the endowment portfolio. We also benefited from the rebound in emerging markets, uh, in emerging markets in the uh, fixed income portfolio. We have had a position in a emerging markets local currency, meaning denominated in another country's currency, in the debt markets for some time. That was a painful position over the last couple of years, but it has snapped back so far this quarter and over the year-to-date period and been one of our stronger performers. We also maintain this emerging markets local currency debt position in our other portfolios as well. Um, and then furthermore, uh, while U.S. markets outperform developed non-U.S. markets, our managers uh, were able to outperform the index pretty significantly, uh, and that was another source of positive attribution for the portfolio. Um, and then last, I, I'd just like to mention our alternative asset classes. Some of you know that we've continued to build out our alternatives area. Uh, that includes our exposure to private real estate, private equity, and hedge funds. Um, our hedge fund portfolio performed particularly well during the second quarter. 
uh, and we had some uh, positive contribution from both private real estate and private equity as well. So moving forward here uh, to uh, one of our non-endowment portfolio, uh, this is the long-term portfolio. Remember we changed the name at the beginning of the year from Pool C to the long-term portfolio. Uh, the long-term portfolio was up 2.6% for the second quarter and is now up 4.4% for the year-to-date period. So we have had where we've had strong results in the endowment, we've had even stronger results here in Pool C uh, or the long-term portfolio. The drivers were really the same. Uh, emerging markets equity and debt was probably the biggest driver and contributor to performance. Uh, the other aspect that I'll mention, uh, you see a 4% allocation here to real estate. And if you remember our long-term portfolio, uh, we maintain liquidity here. So unlike the endowment where we invest in private real estate, we invest in real estate investment trusts or REITs in the long-term portfolio. And REITs were uh, one of the stronger performers both for the quarter and the year-to-date period. Uh, up fairly significantly and up double digits uh, year to date. And so that was uh, just an additional um, strong performer here in the quarter and year to date period that drove results for the long term portfolio. Um, next, I would want to talk here about the medium term portfolio, um, another non endowment portfolio that we offer our donors. Uh, it was up 2.1% for the quarter and is now up 3.8% year to date. Uh, we have a much heavier exposure to fixed income in this portfolio as it's designed to be less risky. Uh, but we do have a small sliver here of emerging markets um, and that has certainly helped drive performance. The other thing we have here you see is a 5% allocation to commodities. And some time ago, we uh, removed commodities from our policy index, but we have the ability to opportunistically invest in this space uh, up to 5% and have done so and really benefited from the snapback that we've seen in oil and other commodities during the course of the quarter and year-to-date period. Uh, and so that helped us slightly outperform our policy index here on a quarter basis. And then finally, let's move to the short-term portfolio. Uh, still not much to say here. If you recall back in, in, in December of 2015, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates for the first time uh, in many years. And we are starting to see some positive results come out of this pool. But remember, this pool is, is invested solely in money market funds. Um, and for a long period of time, money market funds were close to zero. Uh, they are now slightly positive, uh, but it, they're somewhat ne negligible and it will likely uh, take some time uh, before we see stronger results uh, there. So with that, uh, I'd like to uh, start taking questions. Um, if you do have a question, please feel free to submit it, um, and we will do our best to answer it. Um, I will uh, take our first question here. So let's see. Our first question is, uh, are TSDF return figures net of all fees? And the answer is that we report our figures net of all investment manager fees. Uh, net of all investment manager fees, we do not net out our own fees. So. Remember that each investment manager that we utilize uh, has fees associated with it. Um, all of these results are shown net of those fees. 
The San Diego Foundation then has its uh, fees uh, that are netted out of um, the uh, exhibit that, that we offer you through Net Community that shows your portfolio balances. Uh, second question that has come in so far, uh, what are the implications for foundation portfolios from the recent run-up in the stock market? Horacio, I'm going to let you answer this one. Yeah, okay. Well, um, actually, as we talked about, I mean, it's been good because uh, obviously to, to have the start of the year where we dropped 10% and then rebounded and then to have the drop on, on the Brexit vote and then rebounding, um, those are, you know, those are all good things. Uh, it's hard to, um, you know, as, as a, for a long-term portfolio, as a long-term investor, it, it, nobody can make money market timing. So we run diversified portfolios. We um, take advantage of a run-up to re, to go back to our, to rebalance back to our, to our targets uh, for the markets. And, and therefore, by buying when things have gone down to get back the targets, and by selling when things have gone up to get back the targets, we're hopefully buying low and selling high. But um, but our our view is that these monies, you know, particularly the the endowment fund and the long term fund are um, are there for a long time, and you need to take advantage. You need to capture the equity risk premium that you get. Uh, from investing in, in equity assets, and so we will always have an allocation to equities. We'll just have a, a diversified allocation. In addition to that, if you look at the valuations, by taking a global approach, we're actually being able to invest in things that are more attractively priced than the U.S. market, which has run up the most over the last seven years. Um, finally, um, let me just make a point about earnings. We've now had four quarters of declining earnings in the U.S., uh, and we're not seeing the same thing outside the U.S. Uh, earnings are still going up. Uh, so uh, so I think our positioning, which uh, emphasizes the lower valuation markets and uh, and uh, and foreign assets, uh, should also benefit the portfolios in the long run. Okay. Thanks. And just a reminder to everybody, uh, if you'd like to submit a question for Q&A, please use the questions chat function on your screen. Uh, question, uh, many people say the current market cycle will be ending in the coming months or years. What is the foundation doing to prepare its investments for that reality? And I, I'll go ahead and take this uh, question. Uh, the, you know, the first thing I want to say is just refer back to Horacio's answer in that what we're not trying to do here is market time. Um, so you're not going to see us make uh, large adjustments uh, our asset allocation as a result of uh, any particular events, whether it be the end of um, an economic expansionary period, whether it be Brexit, what have you. But what we have been doing is over the course um, of the last call it two years, is looking at the amount of equity risk that we have in our portfolios and slightly reducing it at the margin. And when I say at the margin, I'm talking about um, a point here, a point there, not a dramatic uh, reduction. Um, we don't know when this cycle will come to an end. Uh, I think it's fair to say we're probably in the second half of the ball game here, um, but it, there is a possibility that we're in a much longer extended cycle than normal, just given the very accommodative global interest rate policy we've seen around the world. Uh, that said, you have been seeing us increase our exposure to alternatives. Uh, number one, as valuations out of traditional markets get richer, um, we believe there are return premiums that we can exploit in the alternatives market. And number two, um, in the area of hedge funds and alternatives, we have been uh, restructuring our exposure there and slightly increasing our exposure to get a little bit more protection from volatility um, should it come back. So marginal changes, uh, not necessarily dramatic uh, changes. 
Uh, next question, uh, again about fees, are the San Diego Foundation fees listed on the website? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, they're not listed on the website. If you wanted to learn more about fees, you could, uh, you could contact your donor manager uh, to learn about the fees that uh, you are paying for your uh, fund with us. Uh, next question, again, I'll ask you this, Horacio. Um, how will the outcome of November's general election affect the foundation's investment strategy? You had to give me that one. <laughs> um, so uh, that's a tough one. Um, okay, so let's start with um, with I, what I think will, will likely be um, not the outcome of the election, but whoever wins. Um, will likely have a divided government. So, um, you know, the House is likely to stay in Republican hands. Um, I think if um, even if Trump wins, um, you could consider that to be a, an adversarial relationship. I don't think uh, I don't think you're going to have a, a, a government like we had in 2008, where you know it's controlled by one party across all three branches. Having said that, um, political risk is something that we can actually look through because you know one of the one of the nice things about about our system is that uh, you know whatever happens, we'll have a chance to redo it again in four in four years. And so, um, so we generally would not change the portfolios at all uh, based on uh, the outcome of an election. Now we. We might look at what the long-term impact of, of different policies are, but, but we haven't seen anything, or at least I haven't seen anything that I would say is going to deviate us dramatically from long-term policies. A very protectionist uh, policy would obviously be negative for the stock market, um, while um, higher taxes would also be negative uh, for, uh, for the economy and, and potentially for the stock market. So. So it's hard to say, you know, that that anything's going to change because of the nature of our government. But it's also, um, I think, uh, you know, we'll keep an eye on. Okay. Thanks. That's going to conclude our call today. Thank you for joining us and for partnering with the San Diego Foundation to advance a vibrant quality of life, maximize the impact of your social investment, and grow a vibrant San Diego region. Today's presentation will be available by end of day tomorrow on our website at sdfoundation.org backslash investments. Have a wonderful day.